to buy a home or an investment property? That is a question we're going to tackle today. While one option might seem really obvious to you, don't make a move until you've considered all the consequences. Otherwise, you may well regret your decision tomorrow, and we don't want that. Welcome to Your First Home Buyer Guide, the podcast for first home buyers who want to move it along and become homeowners. But most importantly, it is for you to become an educated home buyer. I'm Megan and that was Veronica. We're both buyers agents and probably old enough to be your mum. But that's a good thing because between us, we've got over 45 years experience to share with you and market loads of stories about avoidable mistakes. Together, we're going to make sure you get unbiased and real information you can rely on. Allow us to guide you on your home buying journey. We want you to to become an educated home buyer so that you can stop looking for your first home and actually become a proud homeowner. We've got loads of great tips for you in this episode and if you'd like more useful tools head over to the website homebuyeracademy.com.au and there you'll get access to our free mini course how to price a property like a professional. You will also find the holy grail of home buying education your first home buyer guide the online course for people who want to become educated home buyers. We created this for you to help you get on the right path to home ownership for your first home and beyond. But before we get into the interesting stuff in this week's episode we've got the boring bit, the disclaimer. You of course know that nothing in this podcast is to be taken as personal advice. We always recommend getting the advice of an expert in their field who takes the time to understand your personal situation. We've done our very best to ensure that the content is correct at the time of recording. Things change rapidly so always check with the relevant government authority and your trusted advisors to get the most up-to-date information. Today, we're tackling a question from one of our listeners. It's all about whether you should rent best or buy a home to live in. So here's the question. We are a 40-year-old couple with three kids. They're aged 11, 8 and 7. Financially stable and able to save quite well, but they've been priced out of the area where we've built our lives. Is rent vesting a viable way forward or should we look at home ownership? Thanks. Finn. That so we've such a good question. It is a great question. And it's it a is common a, question. It's a common question, but it's not easy to answer. It's not straightforward and like everything that we talk about, there's no <laughs> hard and fast rules here because every situation is unique. That's exactly right. So what we want to do, we want to run through some of the questions that Finn would need to ask himself and, and him and his partner yeah. need to ask themselves before they decide to go down either of these pathways. We're going to talk to you about the ideal candidates for rent vesting versus home ownership. And then we're going to run through the pros and cons of both options, right? And then you're going to have a much better idea of whether one of them or the other is right for you. Absolutely. Now, one question that must be asked and answered for Finn by Finn and his partner is, is it feasible that they will actually be able to afford a place for their family to live in sometime in the near future, say five years. If they're not, are they really ready to fully give up owning their own home? Or is it time to seriously contemplate a location change? And I think this is the really, really critical question that anybody considering rent vesting versus buying a home to live in have to face. That if you're in the situation where this might mean that you are accepting that you're never going to actually live in the home that you own, then you have to be okay with that and then commit to it. Yeah. And that's short to medium term sort of decision making you need to think about. Yeah. Yeah. But if there's a niggle in the back of your head that there's actually a possibility that it's going to be achievable or we might bite the bullet and move location in order to make it achievable, then we encourage you to look much more seriously at the yeah. buying a home, not rent vesting, because rent vesting can be a one way street for a lot of people. And we're going to go into why. So stay tuned because this is a really, really important one. Some people think that by rent vesting, they're just kind of getting their first step on the ladder, but it is a restrictive step. We'll talk about that shortly. Another question for Finn is, are they close to being able to afford a home right now or is it completely way out of reach? So we're we're expanding a little bit on the previous point. Um, and, And that's because, you know, sometimes people are on an upward trajectory with their career. 
So there may be um, potentially a, a promotion or a raise or a commission structure or something that might increase their career. Perhaps Finn's partner um, may have been out of the workforce or part-time for some period of time, might be coming back into the workforce. This could really change their borrowing capacity and therefore their ability to buy a home to live in. Not making any judgments or recommendations here, these are questions that need to be really thought through. And another way that you might be close but just not quite there is that you might have a budget that say your budget is 700000 yet everything that you want to buy is seven hundred fifty or 800000 yeah. You're close. So what could be adjusted and not without a huge adjustment? Uh, and it might be you need to move one or two suburbs away. It might mean that you need to look at unrenovated versus renovated. It might uh, mean that you are going to go, okay, well, we won't get parking or we won't get the um, the extra bedroom or we won't um, we'll get a townhouse instead of a house. Whatever it is, if if there's a compromise that can be made that basically means that you're almost there, the sort of property that yeah. you buy or location, it's not it's not 100% everything you want, but it's a good 90 or even 85%, then we encourage you to push yourself at now. Yeah. You know, and that is maybe extending to a neighbouring suburb because sometimes this window is open for only a small time and then closes forever. And so that's the thing. If you're close in terms of the amount of money you've got, you're just not quite there, don't give up. Now's the time to push yourself and buy a home. Yeah, and, and that, this is a, yeah, there's a lot of navel-gazing to go on here and a lot of real honest conversations to go on here because for some people, changing the neighbourhood is just not an option. You know, doing the three Ps, the position, property, price, doing that process with some real open honesty and some hard conversations together can actually get you thinking about, well, is it really a possibility or are we so tied in certain ways? It may be that you're in a school catchment that has a specific program for a child that has special needs. Now, that's not easy to replicate at a different school. So that's a serious consideration about moving. And if you move out of the catchment area, perhaps you don't get to go to the school anymore. Probably not an option. Um, but he's going to a townhouse, as you say, an option instead of a house or something smaller or some other compromises. So doing the three Ps, the, the where to buy workshop uh, that we have is a really good conversation starter to start to start looking at, oh, hang on, if we did really think about this, could we push ourselves or are we close enough that we could make some compromises that would get us into a home? Yeah. yeah. And that's the where to buy tutorial for anyone who wants to know. It's only thirty nine dollars. is on our website, homebuyeracademy.com.au. And and why we're we saying this at this point of time because because we said the two questions that Finn has to ask is really, are they ready to give up on the dream of owning yeah. our own, their own home? Um, and if you were this close to being able to own a home, then it's not the time to give up on the dream. If it's totally out of the question, then potentially it's you know, you have to give up on the dream. But if it's actually close, you could sniff it, you just can't quite grab it, then it means changing a parameter somewhere to to and, and accepting the compromises and making a decision and getting into the market. Yeah. If you so, don't want to buy a home, rent vesting might be a good idea. Fine. Totally different. Exactly right. <laughs> this that's is exactly if you right. still think in the next five years that you do want to have that home ownership goal. Okay. So yep. it's that mid short to midterm kind of thinking. Now, remember, we're going to talk through the pros and cons coming up, but there are a couple of ideal candidates for rent vesting as a step one into the property market. Yeah. Um, do you want to hit the first one, Megan? Look, these these people tend to be um, in the category where they can afford to get into the market now and buy a good, good quality asset, even if it's not large enough for them to live in. And the income will rise a lot and you can afford a family home in the future and hold the investment cop property. Now, pros and cons, there are some in and out costs there to think about, and there is an impact on your borrowing capacity once you buy that first property. So and this is why this candidate is someone who's on a rising income in their career. That's the where that those risks of being in you know, a borrowing capacity and constraints are offset by the fact that their earning capacity is on the up. Increasing. Yeah. yeah, their borrowing capacity could increase there too. And the second point, Veronica? Well, the second ideal candidate is somebody that can afford to buy a quality asset now and they've really got no idea when they're going to settle down, who they're going to settle down with, where they're going to settle down, and they want maximum flexibility. 
and keeping options. They want an asset working hard for them. They want to actually make sure they're investing in, in property before really they're even considering a home to live in. So they're sort of like your two ideal candidates for rent vesting. And, and let's have a think about who that might be, just to, to get your, your thinking about whether it's you or not. It might be someone who is currently single and they're pursuing a career that takes them in, in different places. So they're physically moving around to different places to work. Um, so getting a property and getting their foot on the ladder where they haven't got an immediate or short-term um, possibility of settling down into a home, that could would be an ideal candidate for a rent vesting option. Absolutely. So let's run through some of the pros of rent vesting versus buying a home to live in, and then we'll run through some of the cons you need to be aware of. Absolutely. I guess the first thing, and we we just really mentioned, is you can buy anywhere. Uh, But of course, buying anywhere doesn't mean buying anything anywhere. (laughs) There's a lot of research that needs to go into making sure that it is a good quality asset. It is going to give you that potential for long-term capital growth that you want out of an investment property. Which you could probably say is a con because all of a sudden all your your options really open up, make yeah, it even more difficult be hard, to isn't work it? out. Remember that episode we did uh, with the, the family who actually weren't tied to an area at all and we suggested to them that they do a virtual road trip. It's almost yeah. like you can do that um, as an investor, but you're not so much looking at your personal lifestyle aspects. You're actually looking at the the rental um, and the investment aspects when you're doing that virtual road trip. Now, there is a lot of conflicting in information out there about what makes a good location to invest in. We do have a uh, tutorial for, you know, called Where to Invest, which is the where to buy for investors. Again, that, that, that one also is $39. You can find that on the courses page on our website. And look, that would take you through the basics of, of say, trying to narrow down, I think it's something like 15,000 suburbs in Australia, and try to narrow down where you might focus your attention in amongst all that. So it's a starting so, point. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. So it's a pro that you don't, you're not limited by where you want to yeah. live or where you need to live, but, you know, can open up a little bit more complexity. And of course, by being able to buy and invest in property anywhere, you're then free to live wherever you want. You just have to obviously pay rent wherever that is, or maybe you can live with your parents. I don't know, but, um, or you're free to travel or you've, well, assuming you've got the money in the cash flow. But so that just gives you a lot more flexibility to move around where you're living without having to worry about being tied to a property that you own. Absolutely. The flexibility, I think, is a big one for a lot of people who aren't ready to really put down their roots in one location. I think the other thing too is if you're if you're thinking, oh, do I rent vest or do I buy a home? And you're a person who is only going to live in a home that you buy for a short period of time, like one or two years. Say you've got a job um, in a regional location, you go right, I'll buy a house, I'll live there for one or two years, but then I'll sell it. That may be too short a time period to actually cover the costs of buying the property and selling the property because you have costs on both sides, buying and selling. And if you haven't got a reasonable amount of capital growth in a very short period of time, which is what's usual in the market, not not post-COVID kind of crazy growth kind of figures, but you know, be a bit err on the side of caution when you're doing your numbers, it probably isn't a great idea and you might want to rethink buying a home if your time frame is short for ho- holding that, at that home or living in that home. Yeah. Absolutely. So a lot of it, we, we talk about property is a long-term game, mm-hmm. you know, and even though as a first home buyer, we know that your first home is unlikely to be your forever home. Yeah. So you do have to sort of plan and upgrade at some point of time. But if that's a really short time period, like, you know, less than five years, um, you know, then that that's really risky in terms of trying to make enough money to cover all those mm-hmm. in and out costs. So, you know, the rent vice investing might be a, a more stable option for you then just to buy it, set, hold it and move around freely and rent and, and have that a lot more flexibility. Um, one of the other pros is that you do get rental income, yeah. which does add to your your income. Often it isn't enough to cover the, the cost of owning a property. It mm-hmm. doesn't often cover the mortgage repayments. So obviously whenever you're choosing to rent best, you've got to be thinking about buying a really good asset because you want to make sure that the capital growth makes up for the fact that you're going to be um, paying the shortfall, certainly in those early years. And obviously that rental income though does add to your serviceability in terms of your borrowing. So it's something to talk to a broker about 
um, as to looking at the options for you. So yeah, if you're a bit run borderline, some scenarios. Yeah. They're, they're know, really great brokers saying, all right, well, this is how much you might be able to borrow. If you had it as an investment property and the income was around this, then you know, this is what it looks like to you. Keep in mind that you've still got to pay rent somewhere else or live with, with a parent or, or someone else that you're not paying rent to. Um, so you've got to make sure that that's in your calculator as well. The other thing that you are, uh, if you are, well, listen, there's negative gearing, right, where you get tax deductions. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute. But if you're not negative geared, that is where you're getting rental income that is more than the costs, you have to pay tax on that income. Yeah. So, and, and the rent that you're paying on the place that you're living in, you're paying that out of after tax Post dollars. So, tax dollars. yeah. So maybe we're going to the con territory here. But anyway, just be mindful of that. Um, and that, look, one of the pros for buying uh, an investment property versus a home is that you do get tax deductions if it's negative, negatively geared. So what that means is if the costs outweigh the income you're getting from the property, which is very, very common in the yeah. early years of owning a property. And as I said earlier, it's why it's important you need to buy a good asset that will go up in value. Otherwise, why would you lose money? It's insane. Yeah. So if you have a property that's negatively geared and you get deductions, um, that can actually help you manage the costs of owning a property. But beware, if some of those deductions are for depreciation, you have to add that back to your cost base when you sell the property. So a lot of, and this is where a lot of people get sucked in when they're buying brand new property. Yeah. Because all the spruikers are out there telling you how much money you get back in your tax. What they don't often tell you is that when you go to sell, all that money you got back on your tax, you have to add back in and you don't, and you, you often have to then pay tax on it as a capital gain. Yeah, so, reduces your, your, your um, it increases your capital gains tax and reduces what you end up with in your pocket. Yeah. So we're well into accountant uh, advice territory here. So big part of the course is a course, building your team at the start, your support crew. So having an accountant have these discussions with and look at the scenarios could actually open your eyes up to a really clear answer about which one is the best way for you to go. Absolutely. Which I guess leads us into the cons. So these yeah. are things that you really need to be aware of um, if you're thinking that buying an investment property is just an easy way to to deal with this idea of getting on the property ladder. Yeah. If you think, oh, I can't afford a home in the area that I have to stay in and and I just want to get onto the, the property ladder, these are the things to really think about um, because you lose any ability to access any grants or incentives that you may have had as a first home buyer. So there aren't any grants or incentives. Um, uh, a lot of the equity schemes aren't offered for people who are buying investment properties. That's a property that you're not going to live in as a home. So whilst we are not advocating that you choose a property based on your ability to get a grant or receive an incentive for that property, it is something to consider that you will lose that when you go to buy your home in the future, but it just won't apply to the investment property when you buy it. Yeah. So you don't get it for the first property you buy. That's the property you're investing. And then you no, you don't get it for your first home either. Yeah. So if those grants are available to you and would make it more affordable to you, um, then, you know, you'll be seeing out on those. Yeah. And, and, it's a, and it's a property you were going to buy regardless of the grants or incentives. Mm. So, you know, you're not making a decision on a property because it fits within the criteria of, of a particular grant. It gets sticky, this one, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? And as a consequence, you're going to need a higher deposit. So whereas a lot of first home buyers, when they're buying a home to live in, they use, utilize those grants to offset um, their savings uh, and so they don't actually need to save as much. And, and Or an example is when they use their home deposit guarantee uh, for the federal government, for example, they don't need 5%, so they need to save up 10% or 20% or whatever. So buying an investment property without access to those sorts of schemes is going to mean that you're going to need to get much closer to uh, a 10 or 20% deposit. And thinking about LMI as well, of course, because that can apply with an investment property as well. Um, so you, you are going to need to save more money up front yeah. for an investment property. But of course, remembering that it's percentage of the purchase price, so it could be a lower yeah, could uh, be, purchase yes. price. Yeah, it's all very messy. But generally speaking, for the equivalent property, you're going to need a higher deposit than you would if you were buying it as a home. Yeah, look, there's differences in interest rates as well, Veronica. And, mm. and a lot of people aren't aware of this, that there is often a discount offered off the variable rate for owner-occupiers 
Uh, but, you know, since we had a shake up a number of years ago in the, the financial services industry, those uh, discounts have not been offered generally by financial institutions to investors. So generally what you see is the advertised variable rate is the probably the most applicable rate to an investor as opposed to a discounted rate for an owner occupier. So that just means that your holding costs generally are going to be higher as an investor than as an owner occupier. Um, it also, and this is the really big con for me, and that is that it could yeah. limit your borrowing capacity to buy your future home. And this is we I touched guess, on this earlier, Veronica, and, and I think this is the really big one that people don't really understand. Yeah. And the impetus for this episode really has been a couple of strategy sessions I've done recently with people who have, in all good faith, gone ahead uh, with really little kids as well and bought investment property. One one couple bought two investment properties, the other one just bought one, bought an investment property thinking that that was the sensible thing to do to start building their wealth. Yeah until they were at a point where both parents are back working and they could afford to buy their family home. Yeah. Now, in both cases, <laughs> they cannot borrow enough money to buy their family home. And now they're looking at they have to sell these investment properties that they've only owned for a few years yeah. and incur all of those costs And um, because otherwise they still won't be able to buy their home if they go to keep these properties. So- yeah, can we just lay that out a little bit more clearly? Mm. So w what's happened there is if they did not own any other property, they could afford the home that they want with the features that they want in the areas that they want to live in Yeah, if they didn't have the other properties. So the long-term picture that we are encouraging you to really consider is what is the impact of having made a decision to buy an investment property prior to buying your home because it it prevents or it limits the amount of money that the bank will borrow you once you have already got lending against a property. And so there's really there the the great tragedy in those situations is that these these people have gone into rent vesting in good faith, yeah. thinking that this is going to help set them up for the future. And then they're really quite shocked when they realize it when they're ready to get that family home. But yeah. the very fact that they've rent vested means that they're going to have to pay a lot of money in tax, money that they hadn't thought that they would have to blow on tax, yeah, yeah, tax, yeah tax to sell it. and selling yeah. costs and all the rest of it. And it's like, oh, and they're not as well off as they could have been if they'd made a different decision earlier on. And in yeah. both cases, they could have actually bought a home to live in and looked at the stepping stone strategy and upgraded and they would have been better off. And so this is the thing. That, you know, that's why I said earlier, like with Finn's question, you know, if he's close and he just has to make some compromises, yeah. then then potentially that can make you better, it set you up in a better way than just rent vesting because you can't afford what you want in your dream home now. Yeah. And, and this is about encouraging you to talk to the right people about your situation, to have the right questions to ask, to have those really robust discussions with your partner about, well, what does this look like for us? And to gather all the information in so that you're making a really well-informed, intelligent decision based on facts, not based on what the Uber driver suggested to you when, out, when you went out for dinner the other night because their, their mate had done it. Um, you know, you want to kind of remove all of that noise, get rid of all of those other opinions and really focus in on, okay, ooh, wow, we know some of the risks now. Let's start really talking about this. Go to the right people, the accountant, the mortgage broker, ask the right questions, talk about scenarios. What if we do this, this, this and this? What's What's the impact of us doing it in that order? Well, what about if we do it in this order? Like these are scenarios that a mortgage broker can run really quickly for you once they've got all of your information. So it's not a huge imposition to ask them to run these scenarios for you, but it can give you so much valuable information to then say, all right, well, the impact of us doing the rent vesting first is potentially this, or if we do a compromise on the home first, then here's what the impact is. Just knowledge is power. It is such a great position to be in to have reliable information from experts that's based on your unique situation. Yeah. Another con of rent vesting, because it usually means that you have to rent somewhere else. Yeah. And certainly this is a bit unique to the current situation across the country where we have a very well-publicized rental shortage. Yeah. And there's renter uncertainty, that risk of increasing rents or the owner selling or moving back in. 
and and the pressure of this, particularly if you have a family and you've established yeah. yourself in an area as well. Yeah. You know, and this is the the great irony. A lot of people will say, I'm going to rent best because I want to stay in the area that I've established my family. And then if for whatever reason your lease is terminated and you cannot find another rental in that same area, you're going to be forced to move out of that area anyway. Yes, or so, compromise terribly on what it is that you can rent. Exactly. And so that's really horrible. So yes. I think that the renter uncertainty and that risk that is what's driving a lot of people now to say, okay, bugger this. I don't want to do this anymore. I actually want to own my own home. So people that previously had been close to it but thought, oh, it's too easy to rent, now it's not so easy to rent. So I think that's a real con it's for choosing. It's certainly something to consider. Mm. And, and look, we're not seeing a resolution to that in most states in the short term. It is a long-term problem that, that involves all sorts of people ha- coming in together to, to provide a variety of different solutions to to, to this rental crisis and it is a crisis and it, it is real we, it, yeah. don't ever think that this is just a media beat up it certainly is not no now, you've got no let, let's go on um the other thing to think about is capital gains tax now we mentioned a little bit earlier when we talked about adding back from a capital gains tax perspective on the, mm. the the cost base but when you sell an investment property you pay tax you pay capital gains tax and you don't do that when you sell a home that you have lived in for the entire time that you've lived in. Now, let's just kind of have a look at what that looks like. Capital gains tax is, is calculated based on the sale price, um, the difference between the sale price and what you paid for it, and a few other things and some add backs and some blah, blah, blah. And there is some concessions. So if you've held it for a certain period of time or there's other concessions that might come into play. So when your is accountant it- calculates that, right? You can go yep. to the ATO website and have a look, but when your accountant calculates that, you are going to pay tax at your marginal tax rate. That is whatever your your income tax rate is. On half of the game. So basically once they've That's calculated one of the concessions. Yep. all the different, you know, that so but say say for example, and I'm just gonna put this in sort of dollar terms for you. Say you could afford a six hundred thousand dollar property today, right? And you decide to go out and rent vest instead of um, buying something smaller to live in. And if you do the stepping stone strategy, uh, and we've got a workshop on that as well, if you go and do the stepping stepping stone strategy, you're going to be looking at your first purchase. You're going to live in it and you're going to be thinking, okay, this thing has to grow in value so that when I go to upgrade, I'm going to sell it and I want to make sure it's a really good asset so it helps me get closer to where I want to be, right? Yep. If you choose rent vesting, you're buying something, you're not going to live in it and you're still thinking you're going to sell it down the track when you're ready to upgrade your home. Say you spend $600,000 and say it's worth $800,000 in, I don't know, say five years, just just argument's sake, right? So rough numbers, you go to upgrade, you've got your $200,000 capital gain, cash, plus minus whatever costs of selling and, and stamp duty and whatever, plus whatever equities, whatever you've paid down on the initial 600000 plus your deposit, whatever. So you might end up with maybe you've got $250,000, $300,000 worth of equity, maybe a little bit more if you do it that way, right? Say you've got $350,000 worth of equity, so let's just make it easy. So that's, that's your walk away cash. you got $350,000 in this scenario to use towards your next property. If you go the rent vesting and you spend the same amount of money and you make the $200,000, give or take or whatever, you're going to have to pay tax on 100000 Say your marginal rate is 37%, but- so you, you're going to take out... Thirty-seven thousand um, dollars, and so you got thirty. You got ten percent less to spend. So, so that's the difference, and so that's what you've got to be aware of: the difference between buying stepping stone strategy or, or rent vesting. And remember, we're not giving you advice one way or the other. This is about us giving you information to take away to have conversations about your unique situation and talk to your advisors about. Right. So, this is not a judgment one way or the other. It's an eyes wide open. Yep. You know, use this information to your advantage for your own good. 100%. Um, the other thing, uh, I, I guess, um, that we do need to bring up is land tax, Veronica. And in most states, uh, land tax is applicable over certain thresholds if it's an investment property, but usually not if it's a home you live in. Yes. And so I think in the ACT, you do pay land tax on your home, but that's a small amount. It's spread out, right? Whereas in in all other states, and you don't pay stamp duty, right, when you're buying. But in all other states, you pay stamp duty when you buy a property and you only pay land tax if it's an investment property, right, unless you're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars. We're not worrying about that end of the market because that's not typical first home buyer territory. And But in Victoria, 
they've recently dropped that threshold. So quite often your first investment property might still be under the threshold. You may not have to pay it depending on which state you're in. But if you're in Victoria, pretty much everybody that owns an investment property now is paying land tax. And that's quite a lot of money and that you don't have to pay that if you're living in your home. It's just outrageous, isn't it? I, I see here you've written that the unimproved land tax threshold or the unimproved land threshold is fifty thousand dollars. Yes. Now when we talk about unimproved nothing. land value, that's the rateable value if you like. So that's what um uh the value of general has assigned to the value of the land, not the sale price of the property, right? So it's the the value of the land according to the, the value of general's department. I don't know that you can get any land for fifty thousand dollars. It's mm. nuts. Pretty much everything (laughs) is over the threshold. So everybody, every investor is paying land tax. So just something to be aware of. And I I can honestly tell you uh, some years back, um, I got my first land tax bill in New South Wales (laughs) a a long time ago now. And I was shocked because nobody warned me. So take take yourself, put yourself warned. It is is a a surprising thing to a lot of people that they have to pay land tax. Um, So again, that's just a... Sorry, but buyer beware. If you're if you're going to be a property owner, you have to understand what your costs are going to be, and that's one of them. If you are an investor in most states, and sometimes if you're an owner occupier, as we've pointed out, right. So we've run through the pros and cons of rent vesting versus buying your first home to live in. We've talked about the ideal candidates and the particular questions that somebody like Finn in his situation would need to be thinking through before deciding to go down either path, right? So there's not a a right or wrong. It's just that you do have to have your eyes wide open, as Megan said earlier. We've mentioned our three tutorials all the way through here. We've mentioned the stepping stone tutorial. We've mentioned the where to buy tutorial. We've also mentioned the where to invest tutorial. And we do actually have a little kickstart package um, bundling all three tutorials together for only $99, right? Um, The reason I'm mentioning that is because if you're listening to this episode and you haven't really truly worked out exactly which is the right strategy for you, those three workshops are really useful in kickstarting your property thinking. So it's before you get ready to actually literally search for properties, before you're really ready to get to buy the the whole Your First Home Buyer Guide uh, course, this is sort of preliminary work, if you like. So I will put the link in the show notes in case you are interested in the Kickstart package. It's a great way to get your very thought provoking, yeah, yeah, good conversation pieces if you're buying with a partner as well. Yeah, absolutely. Now, a quick note: you might think that we cover everything you need to know in these podcasts, but a word of warning: we don't. We just scratch the surface here. If you really want to be an educated home buyer, you need to learn all of the steps and how to do everything in the right order. And our first home buyer guide course only costs $990 and you get direct access to us to help guide you through your negotiations. And trust me, trust us, we're real estate agents. <laughs> you will overpay a hell of a lot more than $1,000 if you don't know what you're doing. So we're here to help you, guide you through the whole process so that you don't put foot wrong and you get it right. In this episode, we've only touched on a tiny part of the huge amount of things you need to know to become an educated first home buyer. There is so much more for you to do. You can learn all of the steps in the right order and avoid all of the mistakes that others have made in our 10 step online course for first home buyers. If you'd like to learn more about the right process and avoid making rookie errors, become an educated home buyer. Head over to the website, check out your first home buyer guide the course that we have created for you. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss an episode. And if you've liked what you've heard today, please give us an iTunes review. It helps other people find us. And of course, I know it's a bit cringy, but we're going to ask for five stars. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. We hope you've found this really useful. And if you have, please share the love with others who you know are in the same boat. We'll be back next week with more priceless stuff.